Hi, my name is Tom Hugh Jones, and I'm the executive producer and writer of Tiny World, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. So on today's show, we've got Tom Hugh Jones. He is a writer and executive producer for Tiny World on Apple TV+. Plus. Now, this is a nature documentary style show, and it is like nothing you've ever seen before because it focuses on the smallest animals in the world. So if you can think about the challenges of doing a nature documentary, now compound that by focusing on the teeniest little animals and insects in our world, that is what Tom Hugh Jones had to work with on Tiny World. And even though he's the writer and executive producer, he is, he's is he got his hands on everything. So we get to dive deep into the cameras that they chose, the lighting that they chose, the different techniques that they had to employ in order to get these shots, and all the unique lenses that he had to use for very specific moments in the show. So there's a lot of information jam-packed into here. Plus, it's really cool to talk to somebody on the writer and executive producer side of things. We don't often get to do that on Go Creative Show. So this is a show that you guys are gonna absolutely love, and the show you're gonna love even more, Tiny World, so you should be checking that out if you haven't. But even if you haven't, you're still gonna learn a lot from this episode. So thanks for being here, and I cannot wait to share this interview with all of you guys. So I'm here with Tom Hugh Jones. He's the writer and executive producer for Tiny World on Apple TV+. Tom, thank you so much for joining us on Go Creative Show. A pleasure. Nice to be with you. This is such a good show. Like, there's been, you know, there's been a lot of kind of these nature shows out there, and a lot of them become quite popular. I mean, uh, Planet Earth was a huge one that everybody was going crazy over when it came out. This is kind of the next evolution of it in a way. I think there's something about Tiny World that takes this kind of nature show to a new level. And it's not just because you're focusing on, you know, the teeniest animals in the world, but there's something about the cinematography and the writing and just the storytelling that I think really brings this genre to the next level. So congratulations on such a fantastic show. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, we we really wanted to try and do something uh, very different and to to make these characters larger than life, both in the way you see them, but also in their stories. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, from a cinematographer standpoint, it's just stunning how you're even able to do this. I mean, just watching the first couple episodes, I'm like, how can this be real? It's it's too <laughs> It's imp- how are you getting this close to these animals to make them feel so huge and just playing with scale? And there's a lot to the cinematography that we're certainly going to get to. But before we even get there, I just kind of want to start from the beginning and get people up to speed with what the show is. So can you just give us an explanation for the people that aren't familiar? What is Tiny World? Yeah, so Tiny World, unlike most natural history series which focus on the lions and elephants, the really big impressive creatures, sets out to shine a light on the smaller animals of the planet and show that their lives are every bit as fascinating and as exciting as any of the the most kind of celebrated animals that you might see on your average wildlife show. Um, We go to all the different corners of the world, from jungles to deserts to oceans to woodlands, uh, to tell the stories of the little animals that actually are often the creatures that really make the world, their little worlds go round and show the extraordinary things they have to do do to survive in a, a world of giants. Why do you think these animals up until now haven't been highlighted the way that the larger animals have? I think it's twofold, really. I I think just from a very simple point of view, they're so small, it's hard to appreciate what life is like for them. And and you're physically actually looking down on them and they seem small and insignificant. Uh, So I think often it's just a case of perspective, not really being able to empathize with what life is like for them. And then also, I think, you know, inevitably, they're often creatures that are quite different from us. So insects, bugs, you know, they, they look kind of alien. So at face value, they're, they're harder to relate to. But the truth is, 
you know, it, to a large extent, they're all trying to achieve the same things as we do. So they they actually, once you get down onto their level, they they have a lot of character and. Um, yeah, I mean, often often the things they're trying to achieve, the odds are so much bigger when you're small, you know. <laughs> Survival is much harder when you're small. So in some ways, their stories are even more impressive. Well, it's not often that we get to speak with writers and executive producers on Go Creative Show because we're primarily focusing on directors and cinematographers. So this is right. a, a really good, rare opportunity to talk to somebody like you to get a better understanding of what your role is on a show like this. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know what, it was quite interesting when, when I was talking to my boss about what I should be credited, credited as, because I got really involved on a granular level on it with the filming and the planning of the series, but then at quite a kind of, uh, a step back level on, on, on the kind of content across the series and what the overall shape of the whole thing would be like. So I think in wildlife telly, unlike, I don't know, a movie or something like that, the, the, the roles of each person are much more blurred. So I know, for example, in a movie, the, the director is a very different role to the producer, whereas wildlife telly, we tend to have producer directors. So uh, everyone gets their hands dirty and, and gets stuck in. Um, I suppose it, it really was something that was in my mind. So I was responsible for kind of coming up with the concept of the show and pitching it and 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 selling it and then developing each episode and the storylines um and then very involved in the writing of the scripts but uh working really closely with the teams right through the production period from working out what we'd film to how we'd film it to filming it to putting it together in the edit so i guess i was involved uh from beginning to end more more traditionally an executive producer would be overseeing it and let the series producer and the teams get on with it and then come in for consultation but i was definitely much more involved on this one an executive producer is one of those roles that you're kind of like what do they do like it's it's, <laughs> it's so easy to say okay the cinematographer does this the you know production designer does that the director certainly people have a an understanding of what that is but once you get into the realm of producers executive producers it becomes a little bit of a gray area because it kind of spans so much it can be a lot yeah. it can be a little I agree. And, and, you know, that part, I, I almost didn't want an executive producer credit on this one because I think people are quite used to, you know, that celebrity or whoever saying I'm going to need a credit on it when they potentially didn't have much to do with it. Um, whereas I, this was something really close to my heart that I was involved, involved with. Having said that, I work with, you know, very talented producers and there were two series producers on this series as well. So I don't want to take away from <laughs> their enormous contribution as well. Talk to me about the structure of the production and how, you know, how you acquired all these episodes. Like uh, what, what, was, what were the teams and how were the episodes divvied out? Right. So when we originally uh, spoke to Apple about it, uh, we were going to make six, uh, I don't know, you don't have to have a specific time for a streamer because, you know, they don't have ad breaks and that kind of thing, but they were going to be around your usual length. Uh, so, you know, a kind of 48 minute show. Um, and the more we looked at the content, the more we thought, you know what, with natural history, it gets a bit tiring after about half an hour sometimes, when, and, and especially with these small worlds where you're going quite, uh, you know, small and focused in these very almost claustrophobic spaces. Maybe it'd be better to make them short, but make them really action packed and, um, you know, make them zip along. So we said, well, how about making six 48 minutes? Let's do 12 30s. Uh, and that was both a, a genius move and a massive mistake because it turns out making 12, 30 minutes is probably more work than making six. <laughs> I mean, you know, making 12, 30 minutes, I'd say, was more than double the work because there, when you watch one of the shows, you'll see that there's there's a huge amount of stuff going on in each one. I mean, we could have easily made 45-minute shows. So the shooting ratio didn't go down and the work for the team's didn't go down. So it feels like we, in that one decision, we doubled the amount of work we had to do. Um, so that was tricky. Uh, and then also because Apple was a relatively new to the uh, streaming game, you know, they're very hungry for content. So that they, they, you know, the resources weren't the limitation and the limitation was time. They wanted it made in double quick time. So normally on a big, what we call a landmark wildlife series, you would have 
two years minimum to film these things. We we had just over a year, and once we'd worked out what we were wow. doing, we you know some some things. For example, there's one show about the woodlands in America, uh, and basically everything happens within a period of three or four months. You know, May, June, July, August, and and then it's pretty much over. So we're trying to fit everything into a three-month filming window which wasn't helped by the fact that it was probably the worst summer on record (laughs) where we were trying to film so it it was a huge undertaking it's ironic filming small small animals became definitely the biggest challenge i've ever taken on uh, as a wildlife filmmaker um we had a team up to 100 people at one point um and i think we had people out in about 20 different locations at any one time so it it was a, a real head fry and and you never knew what was going to, you know, with wildlife, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So normally you go, well, let's go and shoot this and see how it goes. And then depending how that goes, we'll decide what we're going to do next. Whereas we didn't really have that option because everything had to be done so quick. So it was just like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And we'll see what happens by the end of it. Now, I, I'm o- I can only assume that you had to have different crews per location or. Yeah. Okay. So talk to me about kind of how you arranged and organized that. I mean, on this show, we certainly hear a lot about shows having multiple directors of photography and episodes being shot, sometimes even overlapping. But a show like yours, it really is complete like crews encapsulated in different environments telling different stories across the world at the same time. Um, just the logistics of that are incredible. And I'd love to hear more about how you structured your crews. Yeah, so at first we were going to have a producer director doing two shows each, and then they were going to have an assistant producer, assistant director, and a researcher, and a production coordinator who's the person that helps arrange all the logistics. Um, it quickly became clear, you know, due to the time constraints we've discussed, that that wasn't going to work. Um, so we, we decided to have a producer on one producer per show, with one exception, where one one producer made two shows. Um, and yeah, they, they had teams and we just had to keep bringing on more and more people. And I worked with a very good line producer who could see this kind of huge amount of work coming down the road. And he was just very, very active in employing people and, and bringing them on because come June, July time, we were just nonstop. And yeah, so we had 12 teams out all over the world filming with endless things going wrong or the rain's not coming coming when they were supposed to or kit breaking. So, you know, you wouldn't imagine the kind of different things you come into the office each day and have to deal with. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, what an undertaking. There must have been a point where you said, maybe I should have done the 48 minute six episode deal. This is like a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Well, then, I mean, the the luckiest thing was this happened a year before COVID. So yeah. by the time COVID happened, we had just begun editing. Um, had we be, still been filming, this would have just it would have you know we had so many complex shoots going out so many places at the same time it would have all fallen apart. But we more or less just about finished filming and we're into the editing phase. So we we had to take that all back to our homes and set the editors up with uh, editing equipment at home and and finish this from, well, this is exactly where I finished it from, from my sofa in my lounge. Uh, but it, it worked surprisingly well, which had just enough time to establish the kind of house style, I suppose, to try and, to try and kind of implement that across the series. Talk to me about your pre-production and how you get an episode kind of from in your mind to actually ready to shoot. So, yeah, we work as we work as, you know, we meet each team. And I think what we decided, you know, is we really wanted to have a narrative to each each show. And, you know, I'm really pleased you noticed that because I think sometimes wildlife shows that at worst are a kind of collection of great scenes, but with not much more than kind of, you know, tenuous links to join them together. And and we really like the idea of setting each show in a very defined precinct and um, and having a really defined timeline a chronology you know something is going to happen in this place that is going to affect the lives of all these small creatures and and so that and so we work really hard on that story and then using all the kind of collective knowledge of the team and calling scientists and watching films and reading books we we looked at well what are all the best stories we want to tell 
in this place and how can we weave them together into into a shape that will fit the narrative we're trying to tell and there's a bit of kind of ebb and flow you know sometimes you think oh that's just so cool we've got to show it but it doesn't really fit the narrative we'll make it work and you know sometimes you find something going no, that's perfect or you find something that's not that interesting and not on your narrative go right we're definitely not doing that so you spend a lot a lot of time trading stories really and trading ideas going yes let's do this let's not do that um and then finally when you've got a a script or a shooting script a rough outline with how the how the sequences are going to work and how they're going to play into the narrative you sign that off with uh, with our exec at Apple, and then we we think right, let's let's go and start shooting it. You're constantly adapting and evolving because you know something happens. You go, oh, that animal we thought was going to be a really important character. It's not that it doesn't. It's not that great actually. But look at this one, which we thought was just going to be a bit part, and it's so cool. Look what it did. So then you start adapt. So you're constantly, you know, checking what you actually got and adapting your story and your script accordingly. So. In some ways, you never really know quite what the story is going to be till you get into the edit and you start putting it together and, you know, it sparks all sorts of ideas. So it's very adaptive. Now, on that note, are you generally writing your scripts prior to shooting or do you just kind of wait and see what happens and then write them during post? Uh, in terms of kind of writing the words, we don't really write that till quite a long time into the edit because you know you give you have so much material for wildlife filmmaking it's probably a ratio of about i'd say on this series 500 to one you know for each minute you see on screen there's probably 500 minutes you don't see and and so there's a huge amount of choice of how you tell the story and and you kind of that's a that's a slow whittle with the editor so there's not much point you don't know what that sentence you're going to need is until you've got halfway through the edit but we we go out with shooting scripts, you know, we talk what would be a fun way to tell this story, what shots would it be great to get to make this the most interesting way to show this behavior. So you go out with a plan and then you get the call from the field saying, you know, that plan, <laughs> that's not going to happen. So then you go, OK, well, what is going to happen? What did you get? OK, let's change the focus. So it's it's very adaptive like that. Um, you have I think you have to go out with an idea of what you would hope to get. But yeah, and you have to be really ready to adapt to the situation on the ground. And and that's one of the real skills, you know. I don't know. For example, in the jungle episode, there's a moment when the little marmoset plays with a, a big grasshopper or a catadid. We, we had no idea we were going to film that. That It just happened. But it became a really memorable little moment. And, and so you start thinking, right, how can we film around that to, to make sure that's going to work in the story? Have, were you on set for any of the shoots? You know what? Hardly at all this time because it. I was really hoping to, and normally I I, I am out on location for at least some of the the shoots. But it it just became obvious this was such a logistical nightmare, <laughs> and we have so many shoots. I was going to be much more useful helping all the shoots than being offline somewhere in the middle of nowhere, just focusing on one thing. You know, I, I felt my 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 contribution would be better spread across the series than than just poking one insect in one corner of the world somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that makes sense. And I'm not surprised, but I, I'd love to hear about the crew. Was there kind of one core crew? I know it's not the same people, but did you assemble the same, the as far as personnel goes, the same crew per location? Um, it tended to be that... Uh, the producers and directors found a couple of camera or who they gelled with and who knew what they'd filmed last time. So, you know, it, not, not, not kind of as a strict law, but I would say probably on each show, there were two or three camera people who, who contributed the most, but then there'd always be that extra shoot where they weren't available or something. So yeah, I, in wildlife filmmaking, there's, it's funny. It's it's a very kind of small industry, really, and we all know each other. And there's probably like those ten go-to people who are known for their skills of macro photography and you know their inventiveness and their the little bits of kit they've designed. So as soon as I knew this series was on, which is something I wanted to make for years, I, I got on the phone and said, "Right, you know that thing we've been talking about? We, we're going to do it." Uh, and so. We tried to sign them up. Um, so yes, I and I, I can see the hand of certain camera people on certain on certain shows where it's like, oh, that's very them. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> funny. It's funny you say that because I I thought there was an incredible consistency within the entire series, and it, it 
made me think, I was like, I, I'm thinking to myself, okay, how challenging it would be on location to be capturing this and how strong the visual aesthetic was across all of the episodes. I, I was I was wondering, like, where is that direction coming from? I mean, did you have kind of one primary director of photography that was, you know, putting together the the lookbook for the season or or was it was there anything from a central director of photography um, to inform the overall look of the show? Uh, we were no, not particularly, but I, I think, you know, in the early days when we, you know, partly from looking at other films, but also when the early days of filming, it was much more hit or miss. And, you know, sometimes working with people who didn't quite get get the look as much, but we'd be really, you know, we'd meet every every week or so with all the producers and the team and we'd look at the rushes and go, right, that shot works. You know, mm -hmm. why does it work? It works because you're looking up or it works because you've got a sense of scale. So we started and I used to bore the team with my kind of musing emails each week with kind of, you know, here's my thoughts for the day. This is what's working. This is not what's not working. And actually, uh, Jay Hunt, who was our executive from Apple, who used to be at the BBC, she, she was really helpful as well, because it's, it's always good to have that person who's not so close to it that they can step back. And for example, her big thing was, you've spent such a long time making me see that, you know, these characters are large in life and showing me what life's like from their perspective. I don't know how big they are. I need some shots where I can see that they're tiny as well. And we're like, Oh yeah, of course. So we then had to go back and kind of go, right. As well as doing all that, make sure you get a shot where there's a really big wide shot and there's a small animal in frame or it's next to something that you know how big it is. So you get these senses of scale. So yeah. Yeah, I, I would say there are certain camera people who really got what we were doing and we would sh share the, those images with the team and say, look, this is what you're trying to do. And and it our kind of hit rate definitely improved through the series. And by the end, we really knew what we were doing. <laughs> Isn't that always the way? If only you yeah. could shoot it after you finish shooting it, it would be perfect. Yeah. That's always it, the way it is. It did become really clear, you know, you have to... There were a few shoots at the beginning where they just hadn't quite got the camera low enough. You know, there's a is a really fine line between a small animal looking kind of small and slightly out of focus and slightly nerdy to getting down there, getting them really sharp and suddenly them looking like these fantastical beasts. And um, the, 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 I've not worked on a wildlife show where the directing has been, you know, you, with, with small animals, you can kind of put the camera anywhere. So it's up to you to decide where you where you want to do so. In some ways, it's really fun as a wildlife filmmaker because you have the ability to to direct the sequences much more. Um, whereas when you're filming a lion, you know, it's going to do what it's going to do, where it's going to do. And you can just about hope to be in the right place at the right time and pick an angle. But then it's out of your control. Well, what were some of the things like in your emails, your weekly emails? What were some of the guidelines that you gave to your cinematographers that were like must captures uh, for yeah. each episode? So I think close and wide was one thing. You know, I think I think sometimes uh, ma macro photography shares a lot in common with long lens photography uh, in that it tends to have a shallow depth of field. And sometimes it looks like you can't control you that depth of field. So, you know, it's it's you know, a bit of the back of the animals in focus, but the eye isn't. And when they move, uh, they go out of focus. And also it, it tends to make the, the backdrop feel very very flat, you know, because it's compressed on a, on a long lens, essentially. So I think what you don't often see with small animals is getting down low with them and the, the, their, their background or the, the scenery, the stage they're on, feeling big and epic. You know, so I don't know, the termite mounds or the grass becomes like a forest behind them rather than just a kind of out of focus blur. So getting low, close and wide, I think, was was a real prerequisite. Um, what else? Thinking really hard about how your characters make an entrance. You know, what is that shot? How do you how do you introduce your character? You, you know, thinking what what does this animal make you think of and how's the best way to allow it to enter the stage you know is your your entrance is really important so that was something um god there were all sorts of things i think i think looking looking at the the landscapes as well and trying to think well what what does a blade of grass look like to a to a small animal and and trying to make those large and light uh, a lot of time we also spent was you know, some of the challenges of filming small animals is simply that your front element of your lens is 
just you know there comes a point where it's too big to make that animal seem big you know if the if you're using a normal camera lens which is what probably about i don't know eight centimeters in diameter and you're filming an ant that is one centimeter in diameter it's always going to look small in frame mm. so we spend a lot of time looking at probe lenses and uh, lenses with small front elements that that could allow small creatures to dominate the whole the whole frame and i definitely we're going to talk about cameras in just a moment but you brought something up that made me think um how did you handle establishing the villains or the or the the challenges that these animals come across because i think you did such a great job of doing that and i noticed in the cinematography that you kind of employed some similar techniques that we do in movies where you kind of shoot the villain or the you know the the threat in a certain way to make it feel threatening uh, yeah. i'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of how you've created those dynamics between our hero character and the threats that they face yeah, well, you know, a lot of that played on, you know, one of our references. In fact, there's a very obvious reference in the Woodland program to Jurassic Park with the uh, turkeys attacking the acorn ants, for example, where the, the puddle shakes because the, you know, the foot of the turkey is is meant to be so so large on, on an ant scale. Um, so a lot of it, looking at those references of giant animals like Godzilla, and then, you know, sometimes it's just about showing a small amount of that animal. Sometimes it's about the reaction of your hero kind of looking back up at it. Um, or I don't know, in the Islands film, we were trying to show how a, a, a kind of raindrop or a, or a little kind of, you know, stream of water becomes like a tidal wave. And uh, I, again, I think it's to do with, getting low from their perspectives, making, make, you know, that, that old trick of looking, if, if you look up at your, your, your villain, it's going to seem more imposing and dangerous, but then also looking back at your hero and looking down on them. So you're, you're doubling that effect. Um, and then of course, there's just all sorts of weird looking kind of slightly alien looking bugs. So really going to town with the kind of details of these, I don't know whether they're scorpions or velvet worms, the kind of weird alien nature of the baddies. The cinematography is just stunning. I mean, it really, every frame looks like a photo with the quality that you're getting out of these, these uh, images and just the detail. I want to take a few moments and talk about the gear. Um, yeah. Talk to me about the cameras that you ended up using in this, the lenses, and kind of how you got there. We're, let's start with, you know, testing. Were, did you do a lengthy camera test to decide what made sense for the series? Um, we knew pretty quickly that we that our kind of our go-to cameras were going to be red cameras, you know, partly because of their resolution, partly because their form factor, they're very small. So you can get them into, I mean, they're not that small, but compared to the the other cameras in that in that area, they're 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 pretty small. Um, they have pre-roll and they have a good frame rate. You know, it's quite often with small animals, they're moving so fast you want to slow them down a bit to make make you be able to see what they're doing. Um, and we love the idea of being able to shoot things on, you know, five, six, seven, eight K so that we could crop in and, and move around. So I think we we knew we knew reds were gonna be the kind of workhorse camera. Um, and then we knew we were going to need a lot of slow motion, you know, whether it's showing animals shooting goo or taking off in flight. There's there's a kind of wonder in slowing down these these marvelous little creatures and 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 seeing the detail of them as they're doing their incredible things. Um, and uh, we, normally we would have used a Phantom Flex, but they're they're quite big, chunky things. But uh, Phantom had brought out a new camera called a Vo, which again was nice and small, and again made it much easier to get it low or get it into kind of smaller situations. So I think the Red and the Phantom Vo became the two kind of go-to cameras. And then we used a lot of, you know, smaller probe cameras or kind of mini cams that we could poke into really small places. Um, right at the time when we were just we were just designing all this, a, a really interesting new macro probe came out, which was very affordable um, and seemed to have really good. One of the problems of using probe lenses is that they. Uh, they tend to have a lot of aberration uh, on them and, and trying to find a lens that you can, has a small front element, but you can get really up close to an animal and make it seem wide. It, it is, 
it's kind of pushing the laws of physics, really. Um, Can you talk to us about what a probe lens is? I'm not sure we've had that discussion on the show before, and people may not be aware of it. Yeah, so you've probably seen these kind of, they're like long lenses on a tube, and they can be anything from a tiny kind of microscopic probe or, or you know, something with a, with a kind of lens that's probably about three centi- centimeters in diameter on the end. But it, it serves two purposes. A, it, it, it allows you to get very close to small things, uh, you know, almost to put the lens right up to small things. And because the, the front of the lens is very small, it allows you to make that creature seem really big, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. And at the same time, because you're close to it, you're also on a on a wide angle, so you're seeing a lot of the backdrop. Um, a bit like what we were talking about with the the difference between a macro lens and a probe lens. So you're close and wide. It's like having a wide angle lens on your camera, but for an ant. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And, and they tend to be, you know, uh, you know, about as long as your your forearm or at, at maximum. So you can stick them stick them into things, and you and you can actually when you pan your camera because the the probe lens is is kind of stuck out a long way from the axis of your pan. It, it t- makes it look like a, a camera tracking move or something like that. So you can you can be quite playful with them. And you can also get um, 45 degree prisms on these lenses. So you can have your camera on a tripod, then poking down at the ground, but then make the lens actually go through a 45 degree angle. So the lens is looking straight you know, straight across the horizon rather than poking down into the ground. So they have they have a real use. Oh wow. I, I've never I've never heard of that application before with a probe lens, but that that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um I mean so so, so what you, you can get one called a Lauer probe, you know, which is which is a pretty affordable one for a macro photographer. So we ended up using those quite a lot. Um, and then you can get much more expensive ones like a, an Optex Excellence, which has incredible image quality. But actually, you know what? It, apart from those times when we really need to make tiny creatures seem big, we we did find often just using very good quality cine lenses was the thing that made it look the most cinematic. You know, I think when people talk about the detail and the crispness of the images, you, you can't beat a prime cine macro lens. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so quite a lot of the, the 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 footage was shot on relatively standard filming equipment. And I'm going to put a link to all of this in the show notes, guys, so you can check it out for yourself and see some footage. Um, actually, uh, New Shooter did a great little review of the Lawa. Am I saying it correctly? Yeah, um, the Lawa 24 millimeter. It's an f14, um, and the footage just looks amazing. And it sounds like you guys use that on your show too. So I'll put all that yeah. in the show notes. Um, Okay, so I can see the benefit of that probe lens. Did you also have to consider how close you got to the animals? I mean, I'm guessing these are teeny little animals. They're skittish. They're going to run, run away from you. How do you get them in a place where they're comfortable with you being in their space? Got it. It really depends on the animal. Uh, you know, sometimes you do it by having remote cameras. Uh, sometimes they're, they, they're surprisingly quick to habituate to you. So, for example, with, say, the elephant shrew in the first the first episode, you know, it has these racetracks it builds. And, and once it, they've kind of got used to your presence, you can, you can put a camera quite close to its racetracks and you know it's going to come whizzing past you. Uh, you know, there's other animals like insects and things that you can actually handle. So you you can you know you don't necessarily always just wait for that ant to walk past your camera. You know, you, you might pick it up and put it in in front. So um, all sorts of different. Yeah, remote cameras is often often a really good way to do it. Uh, to, to it just depends on the situation really. Or like with the beetles uh, in the jungle film you know dung beetles will come to to poop so you put poop down and they're going to be more focused on the the poop than the uh, than the cameras so in some ways i think it, that that's easier with small creatures than with with lions and tigers which you know know that you're a threat to them and they're a threat to you and they keep their distance so, yeah yeah so there was a little bit of work on your end to get the animals exactly where you wanted them to be when you could Yes, I mean, depending on depending on what, what animal it is, you know, in the island episode, there's a hummingbird that 
there's there's not much you can do to to encourage. Well, you know, you can put a feeder out uh, and get a hummingbird to fly to the feeder, and you can film it flying past as you know it's going to go to the feeder. So there's there's things like that that you you do to increase your chances of of filming animals. I mean, you, there's very few wildlife shows where people literally just turn up in a place where they've heard there's an animal and they they hope to film it. Um, or you know, like uh, with the um, the mongoose in the Savannah episode, we worked with a scientist who spent a long time habituating those mongoos. So like like meerkats, you can walk up to them, they ignore you. So you're looking for ways to control the your likelihood of getting these things. Um, yeah. Now, what was the most challenging animal to film? God, I, I expect that depends on, on <laughs> which producer you ask. Yeah. Uh, you know, interesting enough, I was talking to the the producer about the dung beetles uh, in the jungle program uh, up in the up in the tree, and, and that took us two and a half shoots to achieve. Um, and there were all sorts of problems. You know, finding the right location was really hard, and then you're operating the jungle where it's raining, and there's all the problems with humidity with the kit and the crew and all the fighting insects. Um, then trying to attract the dung beetles wasn't as easy as we thought it was going to be. And it, it actually turned out that human poop is better than, than howler monkey poop. And then to get the shots of them falling hold from on, the trees. Hold on. <laughs> now, how did you get the human poop out there if that was going to attract them? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, the dedicated uh, director, <laughs> I won't give you her name, but I, that is I think the, the best. Dog, uh, the camera team, you know, each night would collect collect their their droppings and uh, use them, and apparently wow. it works. A- <laughs> you nature, of, you nature of cinematographers. I, I mean, the the hardest day on a commercial set is nothing like the work that you you people put into your your uh, projects. It's incredible. You know, that's one of the real pleasures of this job. Is is everyone I work with is really passionate about what they do and. You know, they wouldn't wouldn't blink about having to sleep in really uncomfortable conditions or, you know, there's none of that kind of pressure. So I'm a I'm a film star or I'm a movie producer. When everyone's on location, we all know that we're just kind of here to get the shot. And and that often means waking up before before the sun rises and finishing after the sun sets and then downloading your rushes all night. And, you know, when, when you're on location, you're just focused on that. And you know, within reason, people would pretty much do anything to get the shot. And it's it's, it's really great to be working with people who want to do that. So uh, it probably sounds funny to, to to your average person, but it's all in a day's work. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So the dung beetle was a tough one. Anything else that, you know, was maybe not even necessarily difficult, but uh, brought in some challenge that you kind of didn't expect? So, so there's actually 12 episodes of Tiny World, and so there's a whole other six coming out next year. Um, and one of those is the Coral Reef show. And so we were, we were. I think quite often when you're filming underwater, your your cinematic sensibilities take a hit because of the the difficulties of filming underwater. And you know, often when you see stuff shot on a coral reef, which is where we set our film. It, it has that kind of sense of a diver floating around and the shots are a little bit less controlled. And and we really wanted to make sure that just because it was underwater, it still felt like it was in the same style. So we had to work really hard with a very, very talented DOP to kind of make this kit work underwater. So, you know, enable us to take our probes underwater, make them all make them all waterproof and to get get we used a lot of robotic arms and motion control equipment. When you're filming on such a small scale, any slight wobble on the camera, which you wouldn't notice on a normal shot, becomes like a massive mistake. So to get some of the fine detailed shots and the movement into the shots, a lot of it was done by kind of geared motors and that kind of thing. So we had to design all that stuff and then take it underwater. There's a shot in the show where we, we'd kind of worked out that we could take one of these probe lenses underwater and keep it waterproof. And um, they were testing it on the first day and they were filming a mantis shrimp and it saw its reflection in the lens and went up and smashed it. <laughs> Literally one minute to getting it underwater. <laughs> and this is part of the six coming out soon? Yeah, next year. Yeah. Was it always, a, were you always planning on two six seasons or two six episode seasons? Uh, it, that was Apple's call. I, I think what they they realized was was you know there 
there was enough kind of good stuff in there to make two seasons. And actually, had you dropped them all at once, potentially people would kind of get to about four and think, oh, God, I don't know if I can I'll watch the rest later. Whereas I think uh, having it as two seasons is it was a really good idea, actually. And and what, what we've been thrilled by is people who watch one episode seem to watch it through to the end. And then the hope is, you know, come come sometime next year i don't know exactly when it's going to be when they release it they'll be ready to watch a whole a whole nother six so and i think it makes sense for apple who are trying to build their their portfolio you know rather than dropping everything it would just seem like a series wouldn't it, if you dropped it as 12 or 6 i think you know it still just feels like one one drop of of a of a of a series whereas this way it feels like two so i, I think it works for everyone yeah i agree as well so Take me back to being on set. You've got your camera operator. How many how many cameras do you usually have running? Now, I know obviously the circumstances will change depending on the needs, but what's just a typical crew on set? Do you have an audio person? Do you have anybody doing lights? Like kind of how, how do you arrange your crew on set? So I'd say the typical crew would be a, a, a main DOP or camera person, a director, and then there'd probably be some sort of camera assistant or second unit and and their role might be to do i don't know drone work or time lapses or just to help with the lighting um and then you normally have a scientist or a fixer or someone who knows the location and the animals you're working with um i'd say that was the kind of core and then you know you might have one two other people uh, around you're normally only focusing i think you're normally all focused on one shot at a time so it's not often that you've got multiple angles on the same thing. I think there were a few ca- occasions like that. Um, but yeah, you're, 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 you're largely all kind of helping the camera person get, get their shot. But then, you know, there were some specialists we worked with, like we worked with a couple of uh, racing drone champions who we took to quite a few environments because we love the idea of, of flying miniature drones. Like they were the point of view of a hummingbird or a, or a bee or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then there were god what else were there you know we so we use these we we actually work with an engineer to design a, a like a motion control arm but one which could be taken to quite remote remote locations so he he would quite often be on location setting that up getting it ready for the cameraman to to use in the next shot or something like that but it's yeah i mean you know you're i'd say five people on location is a big team with with yeah. wildlife you I mean, this is slightly different, I guess, because sometimes small animals' behaviors are slightly more predictable. But, you know, the general rule with wildlife filmmaking is you'd much rather have fewer people and more time to try and capture that behavior than spend all your money on having a massive team and then only one day because you don't know what the weather's going to be like or if the animals are going to be there. So we tend to be very self-sufficient and everyone takes on lots of different roles so that you can be out for the maximum amount of time to get the behavior. What about lighting? Yeah, lighting, actually, you know what, lighting was a bit of a kind of, look, we talk about advancements in technology and how much that's helped this show. And there were a number of things that helped, but lighting's really underestimated. You know, when you're filming macro things, you need quite a lot of light. And especially if you're trying to do it at high speed, uh, which we were trying to do often, or slow motion, and some people call it high speed or slow motion. Um, so you need a lot of light. And uh, LED lighting has, you know, been a complete game changer um in the last few years because before you'd have to have these big hdmi hdmis which would literally fry fry the poor tiny creatures you were trying to film you know so there were limits to what you could do is now we can use these cool lights and um and they're, they're they're much more they're much smaller they're much more portable you can take them into the jungle they're more weatherproof um so lighting was really quite important and um yeah trying to get that kind of naturalistic lighting, you know, lighting that helps bring them to life and show off the colors of the animals, but feels naturalistic. It uh, was quite an art actually. Then there's, can, can you speak to the type of equipment that you had on set? Like, were you bringing in large fixtures like led Fresnels, or were you bringing in just kind of like light panels and small little punches of light? Like what was, what was the typical? Because the subject matter is quite small, mostly, I mean, there are lots of situations where you can't light at all. So, uh, you know, probably the majority of the animals, like the hummingbird, there's no point in sure. trying to light a hummingbird. You don't know where it's going to go or, or the elephant shrew, you know. It's, so it's a, a lot of a lot of stuff is just done with available light. But with the insects and those kind of things where you have an idea more where they might you might be trying to film them, um, 
it was largely light panels, that that kind of thing, you know, because because they're quite small, you don't need to light a huge area. You're you're you're, you're just trying to focus it on a, an area about I don't know, the size of a laptop or something like that. So you don't you don't need a huge amount of kit. Um, how were you powering these? Were they battery? Yeah, often batteries, sometimes with generators. Yeah, um, and then sometimes you know the nature of some some animals, some small animals. You know, like we made a show in a, in the garden. The last show is in the garden, so you could run electricity. That's one of the great things about the macro world is it's you don't have to go to Africa to see cool stuff. You know, the the insects and bugs you get in your garden are pretty much as cool as the insects as, that you find. You know, in the African savanna or in the jungle. You know, there's on the macro level, there's there's cool stuff everywhere. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, when you watch the show, it has this kind of childlike wonderment to it too. And especially the fact that I think, I think that this is, I mean, it's not really a kid's show. I, I, it's not, not a kid's show, but it feels like something that would really inspire kids to look in their own backyard and kind of find yeah. and just be interested in these small little creatures. So I think it does a great job of that, but I, I don't want to get sidetracked on that just yet. Um, so is there any challenges with having these generators creating noise in the field. Like I, I was assuming, and obviously I was wrong, that um, that having generators out there would be a problem for you. Yeah, uh, I think it just depends. You know, I think it depends. It, so for example, if you were trying to film the marmosets, which are small, the small monkeys in the Amazon film, uh, or, or the hummingbirds, for example, you, you don't want loads of noise going on because they'll be sensitive to it. But there's quite a few animals like it, it, insects or spiders that, that don't aren't, sure. don't really seem to operate on that level. You know, it's it's kind of bigger animals problems. <laughs> They're focused on a completely different uh, different level. So, yeah, I think it just depends. But, um, yes, certainly there's some animals where just being really low key and, you know, a lot of stuff was just captured by a single camera person hanging out either in a hide or, you know, very kind of calm and quietly being as unobtrusive as possible and, and waiting for the action to unfold around them. I was going to mention sound, actually. You yeah, asked about I'd love sound. to hear about it. Sure. I mean, you know, there's music and all sorts of other things going on, so you don't often notice it. But we, we employed a, a, a sound person to work across the series and they went out and just, you know, kind of knock themselves out really playing with all sorts of mini contact mics and all sorts of different techniques, making all sorts of weird recordings in the natural world. So a lot of, not all of the sounds, you know, sometimes we have used some sound effects that kind of heighten the, 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 the experience, but um, uh, quite often a lot of the sounds you're hearing are, are things recorded from, from the location. In the coral reef show, uh, we work with um, scientists who've recorded fish and small animals that you can't really hear it when you're diving because our ears aren't well attuned to listening underwater. But when you, when you listen to the, all the noises of, of the animals that they're making, it's, it's, it's a bit like bird song, you know, they're all calling to each other and making these weird, weird noises. So we had some fun with those kind of things. Now, were you recording sound of the subjects you were filming or did you send sound recorders out to just get the sounds of these animals, you know, at, at a different time? Uh, we not often were we recording these sounds straight on onto the the pictures. No, because you know you've got the sounds of cameras whirring and and cameraman going no no left a bit right okay, a bit. Okay. You know. So you didn't have to worry about while filming. You didn't have to worry about being quiet or anything like that. They the sound recorders just sort of went to the captured the sounds independent of the filming. That's right, and quite often because because you know even though we did our best to film animals close and that kind of thing, quite often you are filming on a long lens. So trying to get, you know, you're better off filming the sound later when you're not going to get in the camera person's way. So they were they kind of just working? You, you'd get a shot, then you'd move, then they'd go and try to get that sound. Were you kind of, were they sort of following you or were they independent crews that did their own thing? Uh, a bit of both, but quite often just independent. You know, you, you, you talk about the story that you were filming and, you know, you'd say, well, it'd be great to have an atmosphere track of this and it'd be great to have the hummingbird's wings and, and this kind of thing. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, because you don't know how you're going to edit it and that kind of thing, you then collect all these sounds and then you give it to the, the track player who then repurposes the sounds what across the... What a fun uh, sound recorder's job. Like, that sounds yeah, know, so... Know, what a great... That, that just looks... If I were a sound recordist, I would love that opportunity. It just seems so. It just seems so cool and different. Yeah, yeah, no, and the, he had real fun. You know, he he was putting microphones on trees and recording the uh, 
the sound of the sap rising and things like that, which, you know, you, you would probably never even know it was in the show, but I'd like to know it's there. <laughs> Absolutely. Talk to me about yeah. monitoring while on set. Did you have a, vi- a video village set up close by or how did you do it? Um, you normally, no, we just use the, the a kind of a field monitor. Um, and it depends on the director. You know, I, I think my, my experience with I keep on and make suggestions, but you have to accept it's a, a collaborative venture. And, and I think when you first work with junior directors, they feel like they have to call all the shots and, and that's not really the case. You know, you have to let them do what they're going to do. And, and you, you know, there's no right or wrong with filming wildlife. You can hold the frame and the animal walks out or you can try and follow it. And one time it will work one time it won't. And, and I, I think if you, if you try and call the shots too much, you tend to really annoy the camera people who often are a lot more experienced than the directors anyway. Um, so personally, I think it's good to kind of watch what they're doing. And then when you can see that they're kind of, you know, setting up the next shot, go, Oh, could we try getting something like this or, or even better watching the footage in, you know, uh, over a cup of cup of tea or a, a drink of beer that night and discuss it and go, Oh, maybe tomorrow we can do more of this or more of that. Um, but yeah, so you're monitoring it, but, um, I think it has to be collaborative. It's, the whole process of wildlife filmmaking is very, it's no one person's vision really. Where was the crew staying? Usually did you, did you stay off site or did you camp in the locations? Uh, a bit of everything, you know, uh, so it depends on, on the show and the specific shoots. So, you know, sometimes they were camping out in the middle of nowhere in the desert. Sometimes they were, you know, in the, in the garden episode, they were staying in people's houses or in hotels in, in Europe, you know, so uh, the, the whole, the whole mix really, um, everything from really quite intrepid and remote to quite comfortable. I, I, I would say, you, you know, we, it, I've worked on, you know, shows like Planet Earth and that kind of thing. And, you know, where you're having to climb to the top of the Himalayas or whatever to follow your animal. That probably when you're filming small animals, that's not quite as necessary. You know, I, I suppose to find the really big megafauna, they tend to be in places humans really aren't. Whereas, as discussed, you know, small animals are operating on a different scale. So in some ways, it's easier to find them close close to people and close to settlements. So there, there certainly was quite a lot of... Uh, you know, rough accommodation, but perhaps not quite as much as uh, on Sun series I've worked on. <laughs> <laughs> In our last couple of minutes, I want to just talk about post production. Uh, what was the workflow like from, you know, the shooting's done now, you got your rushes. What was the next step? So we had a, a, a junior editor who actually went on to edit one of the shows and did a great job and is now uh, very much an editor in his own rights. But he, he was working pretty much from the minute we started getting footage back and putting them together into rough assemblies of sequences so we could see what we got because we knew we were going to have so much material. Um, and, and then, you know, we had editors join who were going to edit each program. And they just have to basically sift through a hell of a lot of material with the help of the producer who can try and kind of make selects and and then it, I think the best way to describe it is, is a whittle, you know, like if you're making a spoon from a block of wood, you're chipping away at things until you slowly see the, the shape, shape of it. And then you glue your sequences together and you put them into a rough assembly and then, and then the fun begins and everyone's like, no, what happens if we put this there or that there, or wouldn't it be fun if this story came then, you know, and, and, and then it's just a really collaborative process. But I, what, what was impressive about this one was because we, we had quite a strong idea of how we'd like the story to play out before we went out and, you know, we talked about these timelines and the characters, you know, the exact detail of how that played out was very much kind of dependent on the editor and what happened in the edit, but there's a surprising faithfulness to what we said we were going to do to what we turned out. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of that in a way, because quite often, with wildlife sh- shows, it's it, there's a bit more of a oh let's just go and film loads of stuff and then we'll we'll whack it together and see what you know put the best stuff first and last. <laughs> um, whereas we were much you know there was an element of that, but we we knew what our narrative was. So there was you know you can't put that sequence there because that's not the right time for when it would happen. So yeah. so we we had to adhere to a story much more. What um, NLE were you editing on? Uh, we edited on Avid. Um, and the reason for that is, I think, you know, these days editing software is 
in a way much of a muchness. I'm sure everyone has their own preferences and that kind of thing. But when you've got big projects, I think the file sharing and sharing sharing across different edits and different projects is much better in Avid. So, you know, if if someone working on the Jungles episode needed a shot of a sun that was in the Savannah episode or whatever it was, you know, that it's a it's much easier to run a big project with lots of different edits all using the same material on Avid. Whereas if you're using I, I might be totally wrong about this, but this is <laughs> this is what I understood last time I was really involved in these decisions. Premiere or or Final Cut is is great and in some ways more flexible, but better for kind of isolated projects. And were you, did you have separate editing teams? Like, per, did you have an editing team per episode or was there kind of one central group of editors that collectively worked on everything as it came in? No, so we had this 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 uh, guy who was editing sequences across the series, okay. but, you know, only to a certain degree, but then now it was one editor per episode. Hi. Yeah, you know, I, I can't like, quite explain that. You know, when everyone had to go and work from home, it was me like, sitting like this, talking to 12 different teams, all in their own room, and normally all in their own houses with the editor in another house. And, wow. you know, I, hats off to everyone because we, we made it work. And um, how did you get into wildlife photography and cinematography to begin with? <laughs> I, I, the the simple answer is my parents were anthropologists and uh when i was young they took me to the amazon jungle or to live with a tribe that they were studying and um i think that was just you know you know a lot a lot of people i work with have some sort of similar experience when they were young they they went to live somewhere a bit more remote or something and that was mine i, I lived in the amazon jungle and was slightly brought up for a year as a, as a kind of tribal kid and so i got to play with all sorts of animals and i think that just inspired a lifelong passion for travel and adventure and, and the natural world wow what an experience my god yeah and then of course we you know i grew up with david attenborough who i think was you know so many young kids heroes of, of my generation so the combination of loving animals and then watching these amazing series like life on earth and just going wow i, w- I want to do what he does <laughs> Was your entire professional career in this field, wildlife cinematography, photography? Yeah, I have a semi, I had a semi professional career, also a DJ. <laughs> uh, I, I got very into kind of dance music, and, and, and there was one point in my life where I didn't know whether I wanted to, to do that or wildlife filmmaking, but I'm very glad now that I'm 40 something that I'm not having to DJ in clubs anymore. <laughs> well, there's no clubs to DJ. You'd be, yeah, out, of, exactly. you'd be out of work. <laughs> <laughs> How, when did you do that uh you know i still do it a bit actually it was i i but you know having having been really into animals and nature i became quite a full-on teenager who was into you know partying and all that kind of thing and uh, i got i got really into music i i discovered all the um all the kind of funk and soul and disco that was being sampled in dance music and i, and I just loved it and it has been a kind of passion for me but i think those kind of strange cross references you know i can't quite say how it in, inspired my filmmaking but i really love working with the musicians and and that kind of thing so um i think you sometimes the your strangers inspirations go to help you make kind of slightly different things don't they they certainly do i mean do you keep up with sort of the the dance music of now or, or is there anybody that you're really into currently <laughs> uh I think I probably, you know, probably if I'm if if there's any 18 year olds listening to this, they probably think I'm terribly old and sound like sound like their dad. But I I really like uh you know kind of house and disco and that kind of thing. And there's lots of people making re edits of 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 the old kind of classic tracks. Um, so I really like that kind of thing. I like a whole mix of music. My son's just got into 90s hip hop, which I was really into as well. Wow. So I'm really. I'm really enjoying listening to all those old tracks with him again. Well, um, I'm hearing, I'm hearing you can kind of hear the drum and bass tracks in current music is really inspired by nineties. Um, yeah, exactly. for sure. Like just the sound of the, the bass drum and all that. It's, it's very reminiscent when you're our age, you, you remember it the first time around. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I like a whole mix of stuff. Um, but I'd say my passion was in that kind of, housey disco stuff there's some really great people making really fun 
kind of dance floor friendly re-edits of of you know classic disco tracks and i i, I have a particular passion for those <laughs> well you know i can't say that i'm surprised i mean there's so many people that are in production that have a musical background and I'm I'm actually not surprised even to hear that you were into dance music. And it, the reason being is there's such an emphasis on production with dance music. Yeah. And yeah. I can hear it in your sound design for Tiny yeah. World. Yeah. I really can't. I th I, the sound yeah. design is something that I think was really just, it's stunningly perfect. And um, there's something about, you know, dance music, electronic music, where that you really can achieve perfection in the production and you yeah. and you can't really do that with live bands as much, but also you don't need it with live bands. Like that kind of imperfection is what you want. But in, in dance music and in electronic music, you can get that perfection that you just can't get anywhere else. And, and I think there's some of that came through in the sound design of Tiny World, I think. Right. Thanks. Well, that's, I'd, I'd like to take all the credit for that, but that we also work with very talented sound designers. The other thing I saw, I was going to say about that. I, I also think, um, you know, when you when you're DJing for people, you have to be really uh, aware of what what seems to be moving them and what they like. And and when you're thinking of what you're going to play over an hour, you have to kind of think, well, I'll do this because that's got an element of this, and I'll do something different there. And I do I do think putting together a wildlife show is quite often the same as putting together a set. You know, you have to bring your different elements and work out how you're going to go between them and how they relate to each other. At which point you kind of you know, you, you show something that's connected and then which point do you completely change it up and surprise people? And, um, yeah, I, I, there's a surprising kind of similarity to me. <laughs> well, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. You're great on the air. The show is fantastic. And, um, I just encourage everybody check out tiny world on, uh, Apple TV plus, like he said, the first six episodes are out now, but there's another six in the can ready to go for season two. Um, it's just a fantastic show. Any last words to our audience, places where they can maybe follow you and your work? Um, well, I'm, I'm working on more series. So, so check out some, some, some more things that will be coming the pipeline soon. Unfortunately, I can't discuss them. Do you want I'm to promote really on... an Instagram or anything like that? Or Twitter? I'm, I'm I'm really really not very active on social media. I'm afraid it's it's one of my things. I I like to just keep myself to myself. But you know, if, if people can watch the show and enjoy it, and it, you know, you said it was pop. It, it's something that I think is really great family viewing. If it, you know, it's, there's loads to take home as an adult, and it's very accessible for kids. So please watch it and enjoy it. I love it. They're short episodes. They get right to the point. Lots of punch to them. Lots of great storytelling. It's active. Like, it really is not what you have in your mind um, when you hear kind of nature documentary shows. It's This is a step above, a step beyond, and I think it's just really, really well done. So in parting, I'd love to just get some, you know, some final thoughts from you for aspiring nature cinematographers out there in the audience right now. What should they do to help hone their craft and kind of break into this industry? Uh, interesting. I was speaking to someone earlier about this. I, I think I think discover your style. You know, uh, I think in a way anyone can pick up a camera and film a, an animal, but to kind of think right, I'm going to tell tell the story from this angle, and that means I'm going to get these shots in this particular way. Suddenly makes it really different, and I think suddenly ha having having a kind of a perspective on things, or or allowing some of your personality to come through in what you do, and discovering what makes you you unique and what you can bring to it is is really important. Tom Hugh Jones, writer, executive producer of Tiny World on Apple TV Plus. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining us. And um, we'd have to have you back for your next six episodes. It'd be a pleasure. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks so much for speaking with me. All right, I want to thank Tom Hugh Jones for coming on the show and sharing all of his experiences on Tiny World. Now, this is a show you guys absolutely must see, so check it out for yourself. It's on Apple TV+, Plus, and the first six episodes are up right now, available for you to check out. I want to thank our sponsors, MZ, Education for Creatives, and Post Lab, Stress-Free Collaboration, and Final Cut Pro 10 and Premiere. I want to encourage you to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, and of course, subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app. I also want to thank Matt Russell, 
for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. He and his team over at Gain Structure um, do incredible work for us, and they could also be working for you too. So check them out at gainstructure.com. And our producer, Connor Crosby, you can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And of course, you can find me at benconsoli.com and my production company, BC Media Productions. But of course, all things Go Creative Show are right there at Go Creative Show. Dot com. And I want to thank all of you guys for listening week after week. We love doing this show for you and cannot wait for the next one. So with that, thank you so much for being with us. And we'll see you next time on the next episode of Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. Filmmakers.